From the beginning of Moby Dick, Herman Melville takes the reader on an incredible journey. It is a story of obsession, revenge, and tragedy for the crew of the Pequod, under the scornful eye of Captain Ahab as they chase after the white whale, Moby Dick. It is also a story of discovery. Melville takes us on a voyage to the sea, where he shares with us an uncharted world full of serpents, squids, whales, and other mysterious creatures. The oceans have always had a mystery of things unknown and is often misunderstood. The knowledge that Melville writes with in Moby Dick of that undiscovered world is sometimes hard to follow, and his language is often confusing. Richard King's new book, Ahab's Rolling Sea, A Natural History of Moby Dick, is a book that helps us to better understand this great novel and guides us through the world of whaling, whales, and the oceans from the time that it was written. As Richard points out, the oceans are as much of a mystery today as they were for Melville, and that Moby Dick is still, in many ways, as relevant today as when it was published in 1851. My name is Stefan Van Orden, and this is Nature Revisited. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. So Richard, our conversation today will center around the connections between your new book, Ahab's Rolling Sea, Herman Melville and his book, Moby Dick, and your life experiences with our oceans. So I'd like to start by asking you, what led you to write Ahab's Rolling Sea? And to share with us, what is its focus? Sure, thanks Stefan for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, In terms of Ahab's Rolling Sea, I think from a thematic standpoint, I wrote it because Moby Dick is really, it's so much a part of our American culture today, and it's so well read and so well known, and yet it really serves as an ideal benchmark for how we understood the ocean in the 19th century, both in terms of scientific knowledge as well as our aesthetic understanding and perception of the ocean as a, as a large environment. And so the novel just serves as a perfect benchmark. 
on a personal level, I am 51 now, and I've sort of spent my whole professional career studying literature of the sea, and I've been able to work for two programs, uh, the Sea Education Association in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and the Maritime Studies Program of Williams College in Mystic Seaport, based at Mystic Seaport, with where the Charles W. Morgan, the last wooden American whale ship, is. And so I've been so lucky to teach literature of the sea, and I've been surrounded by Moby Dick really my whole professional life. For folks who may not be familiar with Herman Melville and Moby Dick, can you give us kind of a, maybe a, a historical perspective on the novel? Yeah. Herman Melville is a person of the 19th century, right around the time that the United States is industrializing. He was born in 1819 and died in 1891, contemporary of Walt Whitman and Frederick Douglass. Harry Beecher Stowe. He was born in New York City and grew up pretty well educated, but his family fell out. He lost his father at a fairly young age, and so he couldn't continue on with his education. So he went to sea. He went to sea when he was 19 years old and crossed the Atlantic for the first time. And then he really had a walkabout of multiple years at sea, including a nearly four-year voyage to the Pacific where he worked on three different whale ships and one American man of war. And then he came back to Boston after that time in the 1840s, right around the time that that Thoreau guy was, you know, about to build a little house on Walden Pond. Melville came back and he wrote a couple books, Taipei and Omu, about his time in the South Pacific, which were sort of part narrative, part fiction. And then he Continued on with novels about the ocean, White Jacket, Mardi, Redburn, and then he really got into what would be his masterpiece, Moby Dick, which was out a whaling voyage. And Melville really had this unique perspective when we're trying to think about our understanding of the ocean in the 19th century, because not only was he an author and focused on poetry and word choice and metaphor, but he really had been to see himself and had lived the life. And so he brought both of those perspectives to his story. So you kind of answered my next question, which is why do you think he chose fiction as the format to convey his his thoughts on nature and the oceans? Yeah, that's actually a really, really good question, you know, because we think about even today in the conservation movement of what is the best way to inspire change. And I don't think Melville with Moby Dick or any of his novels was trying to inspire environmental change in the 1850s. But I do think that he saw it as the highest form of art and a lot of his works as so many people's, so many authors are as a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. And Melville really drew in Moby Dick from a nonfiction tradition and incorporated so many different genres, but at the same time, he's got Shakespearean tragedy, iambic pentameter soliloquies, and, you know, anyone who's read the book, it's just a real kind of mishmash of different genres. Was Melville, was he familiar with someone like Charles Darwin? Can you put Moby Dick into a little bit of a perspective? I think it was written before The Origin of Species, right? Moby Dick is published in 1851, and On the Origin of Species is 1859. We're almost certain that he read A Voyage of the Beagle, even while he was at sea himself on the Man of War United States. But certainly he references it in later works. In terms of where Melville was from a natural history perspective and natural theology, he's a really interesting time in Western history, Western civilization history, in terms of thinking about the natural environment. You know, Melville is very much interested and has been taught in the traditions of Christian theology. And when we say natural theology in its broadest terms, we're sort of talking about squaring the teachings of the Christian Bible with all of these sort of revolutionary ideas that were coming out in Western science at the time. People were finding fossils. The recognition of, that species could go extinct was uh, coming into play with the work of Cuvier and uh, Louis Agassiz. But at the same time, 
the age of the earth was expanding in terms of our understanding of, of how old the earth is and so all these sort of revolutionary ideas and scientific thoughts were coming about but at the same time philosophers and artists and scientists were all trying to sort of square this with what had been taught in, in their churches and their schools and so it was a really interesting time weaving these ideas together, and Melville was very much working with those concepts. The idea of sort of the transmutation of species that Darwin would write up, write up and advance in 1859 certainly was in the air when Melville was writing Obi Dick in 1851, but that wasn't sort of a primary objective of Moby Dick. So you write in your book that Moby Dick is a novel after the eco-philosopher's heart, a proto-Darwinian fable. How so? As far as we can tell, at the end, Moby Dick, the white whale, survives. And pretty much everyone on the Pequot on the whale ship dies, except for one man, Ishmael, who by chance survives and goes on to tell the story. And so... The novel has been interpreted in all sorts of different ways ever since it was written in the 1850s, and that's one of the strengths of the story is that it just continually offers new interpretations, new readings. And from an environmentalist perspective, it does provide a really interesting idea in that here is, in the end, the animal that survives and the character Ahab, who is after the animal, doesn't even die at sort of the hand of or or the fin or the tooth of the animal, but actually dies in the process. Ahab dies by his own rope trying to kill Moby Dick, and he's the one pursuing the animal. But in the process of doing that, he ends up killing everyone on his ship, Ahab does. And so it's a pretty easy jump to sort of think about our own state today and our own impact on the natural environment and sort of how we, in some ways, are really sort of killing our own species by our actions. In terms of Darwin, I don't think that Melville was, was certainly thinking at the time, okay, I'm going to write a Darwinian fable or anything sort of eco-friendly or anything like that, but it does provide some interesting parallels in that it shows natural selection in its in both fashions, both in terms of fitness, like the strength of Moby Dick, but also chance, someone like Ishmael, just as the only one who's going to survive and pass on his genes purely by chance because he gets thrown out of the boat at an earlier time before the white whale sinks the Pequot. So do you think that Melville understood at that time just how important the oceans were to the planet? In some ways, no. I don't think that Melville understood sort of the importance of the ocean in terms of weather and climate and, uh, you know, its impact on uh, species throughout ecosystems all around the world. But he certainly understood the vastness of the ocean. When Melville went to sea in the 1840s himself, there was, for, for a couple of decades, we're talking about eight to 10,000 people out at sea on whale ships in any given year. And these are two to five year voyages. Sometimes they're spending four to six months at sea without even touching land. And so I really don't think it's hyperbole to suggest that we really have never or we will ever have again that many people out at sea just quietly observing the deep ocean environment. Even the early Polynesian voyagers, the sort of greatest, you know, navigators in the history of human civilization, they didn't have that many people out there just floating around observing and watching all the time. And so Melville really had a real understanding of the size of the ocean, its impacts, its indifference to human society, and he did know about extinction and depletion on land and human impact on land environments. But when Melville was writing in the 1850s, and it really comes out in his book, Moby Dick, he really didn't think that humans could have an impact on the deep ocean environment. 
He understood how it was happening on land. He understood what was happening to the buffalo, to New England forest lands. But he really believed that the deep ocean environment was beyond the touch of man, beyond the touch of humanity. And, and I think that that's something that is really intriguing in terms of thinking about where Melville was and where human society was in the 1850s compared to what we understand now in terms of human impact on on the ocean. What are some of the more obvious ways that the oceans have changed since Moby Dick? And, you know, do you think Melville foresaw some of that? Yeah, I, th I think a, a good example, you know, we can look at whales and most, it, it was very much in the air at the time in the 1840s and 50s that humans were impacting whale species, particularly right whales. Um, and it's important when we kind of think about whales and whale hunting that we recognize the different species because Melville's era in the 1840s and 1850s, they had no engine, they didn't have steel hulls, they didn't have hydraulics. And so, you know, they were basically going out and hunting whales under sail, under oar power, using uh, hand-thrown harpoons. But it was in the air in the 1840s and 1850s that maybe humans were really affecting these right whale and sperm whale populations. But Melville in the 1850s sort of sides with the idea that whales are always going to have the opportunity to escape, that they'll always have what he called the polar citadels, uh, that they could always go into the Arctic, into Antarctic, and that instead of sort of locally eradicating whales, what was happening is that the whales were just sort of running away, which, which was not true. It wasn't until we started to get into the 20th century with steel hulls and explosive harpoons and engines and stern ramps that we really sort of are affecting all whale species and at a much greater rate. How did Melville represent whales um, and what was known? And I think that is one of the places where Moby Dick really is revolutionary at the time. Neville was not the first person to write a novel of the whaling industry, not the first person to write either or a nonfiction narrative or even to work with it poetically. But Neville really showed in Moby Dick almost every conceivable perception of the whale. And he even there's even a scene where he sort of shows the perspective of a whale that is harpoon that is looking up on, you know, the human hunters. And so he really does show sympathy for the whales. He spends time trying to show the intelligence of whales, but then he also shows sides of whales being monstrous and, you know, devilish. And so he really is showing all these different human perceptions of whales and the different ways that people have engaged with whales. He even engages in indigenous knowledge and really showing that, for example, with Queequeg, he shows his Pacific Islander hero, he shows him having better knowledge of the sperm whale diet, knowing that the sperm whale eats squid, whereas the Nantucket hunter Starbuck is sort of freaked out by a giant squid. So Melville is really engaging with the science of the day. There are only a couple large studies of whales conducted by naturalists that have gone on whale ships. And so a lot of this knowledge is in flux, just as it's still in flux today. A lot of that knowledge he brought from firsthand experience hunting whales and, you know, in a really crude way, butchering whales. So why does Ishmael go to sea? And how does he serve maybe as a symbol of a climate refugee? That first chapter, Loomings, is one of the great chapters of literature of the sea in English of just why people go to sea. And Ishmael is fed up with urban life. He wants to escape. He feels personally depressed. He wants a purpose out at sea. And in a rapidly industrializing society of the 1800s, the ocean was an opportunity for people to go away. It certainly was rarely profitable in any large way, particularly if, unless you were an officer or a captain. There was that perception that the ocean is the last wilderness, the last place beyond the reach of, of humankind. And so that appeal to go out to sea as a place 
to escape to. And, and Ishmael in Looming gives all of these reasons why he wants to escape urban life and go out to sea. In Moby Dick, Melville certainly is not thinking about climate change or sea level rise or global warming or ocean acidification or any of those things. They're entirely beyond his imagination. And so now reading Moby Dick in the 21st century with our understanding of anthropogenic climate change and the crisis we're in right now, it's almost impossible, at least for me, to read Moby Dick and not look at Ishmael, the narrator, and Pip the cabin boy, as these sort of powerless orphans who are observing larger forces affecting their lives, watching Ahab, his impact on the environment, and then these two characters end up floating on their own without land, without anything to hold on to. And for me, it's a pretty easy jump for a character like Ishmael or a character like Pip to take the two nations like the Maldives or Kiribati and say, okay, here are communities that also have had no effect on, you know, global carbon, and yet they're the ones that are impacted first. Kiribati is a island group in the middle of the Pacific that is very much along the lines of where the whalers went in the 19th century and even arguably where Moby Dick ends. This is an island nation that, because of sea level rise, might have to leave, become orphans in their, from their own nation really within a few decades because of an industrialization of which they really had no part. So you were on the whale ship, the Charles W. Morgan. Give us an idea of... of what a whale ship is like. Uh, the Charles W. Morgan was built in 1841, the same year as the ship that, you know, within six months or so of the ship that Melville went on, the Akushnet, leaving out of New Bedford. So when you go to Mystic Seaport and you stand on the Charles W. Morgan, you're standing on a ship almost exactly the same as the one that inspired Melville and that he spent over a year on. I mean, it's one of the sort of, you know, one of the most important artifacts we have in American history and American literature. It's, it's as if, you know, we still have Thoreau's cabin, as if you're like going down to Harper Lee's courthouse. And in 2010, Mystic Seaport engaged in a, in a four-year restoration of the ship. While they were restoring it, they said, you know, let's take it out to sea again. It had not been out to sea for 70 years. And it went on a tour in the summer of 2014, turned to New Bedford where it was built. It went to Martha's Vineyard. And I got to go on um, two legs of the trip. Yeah, I was really, really lucky to go on the ship. To see it underway, to see it moving, to hear the water in the hull down below, to really think about the decks and all those that had walked on it over the years. It was it was quite a moving experience. It was a very uh, interesting way of life. Yeah. And that's one of the things where to be able to read Moby Dick with access to the ship, we would go on the deck and read chapters. To really understand the physical space is so helpful to understanding the book. And even the way the ship is set up now as a museum ship, you can walk all the way below decks from the stern to the bow. It, it's important to sort of understanding life at sea and, of course, also to understanding the novel and how Melville uses those physical spaces. Once threatened by the harpoon, what, what threatens the whale and pretty much all of ocean life, for that matter, today. Have we damaged the oceans to the extent that they'll never be the pristine and wild seas they were once? I'll step back and say, you know, mostly a literature guy. But I'll certainly say that, you know, we know that the impacts of whales today are very much about noise pollution. They're impacted by fish entanglements, ship strikes. The moratorium that happened in terms of most countries stopping whaling in the 1980s was huge for whale populations, and some whale populations do seem to be really rebounding. But it's pretty difficult to know. You know, we don't have, ironically, we knew a lot more about whale populations in the 1800s than we do now. We don't have 
hundreds of ships out there floating for six months at a time looking for whales. And so whale populations, for example, in the Caribbean, experts tell us that sperm whale populations don't seem to be rebounding as fast as we would have hoped. In the South Pacific, sperm whale populations do seem to be doing better, at least in some parts of the Pacific. But a lot of it is sort of modeling and conjecture. Um, the Many of the listeners will know some of the larger effects on the ocean in terms of ocean acidification and global warming and coastal pollution and oil spills. In some ways, it's it's really quite apocalyptic and daunting. But at the same time, we do have some signs that the ocean really can rebound really quickly. Some of me, you know, some part of me is holding on to that possibility that the ocean and the natural world can really rebound much faster than we think if we can just sort of reduce our impact quickly. And how do whales in the oceans connect us spiritually? There is something about whales, and we do, in terms of conservation movements, it does seem like we need, and I'm, I'm certainly no different, we need these sort of groups of animals that really inspire us, whether it's polar bears or whales, um, that can that can inspire us to really care and to invest and spend time in reducing our impact. And whales really do, they do seem to have a certain grip, they being mammals and their intelligence, but at the same time being these entirely deep ocean creatures. They served as perfect metaphors for Melville because they, particularly the sperm whales, because he knew they dove so deep. And, and so I think that there's a certain element that whales really do have this grip on our imaginations. And that has continued, of course, with the modern environmental movements in the 1960s and 70s. Do you think Moby Dick had a, a strong influence on some of those movements, such as, you know, Save the Whale movement? I'd like to think so, but I, I'm not so sure. Certainly in terms of elevating the sperm whale as an iconic whale, I do think Moby Dick has had a major impact sort of the arrival of the Save the Whales movement in the 1960s and 70s in terms of bumper stickers and T-shirts and moving whales into this iconic status as a conservation symbol. I think that has more to do with, you know, Roger Payne's whale song and Flipper television show. So I think some of these elements like that. So do you think Melville had a sense of the sacred? The Native Americans, for example considered the bison as sacred. They would they would kill it, they would use it, but at the same time, they they had a reverence for it and a respect for it that was what I consider sacred. And and I wondered if, if you think Melville had that kind of that same kind of sense for the whale. I think that Moby Dick was one of the first English language novels to take a marine organism and use it to comment on human behavior. Think about the whale as a metaphor for human life. And so I think in that way, absolutely. And there's sometimes it's tongue in cheek, but most of the time I think it is genuine in his fascination and exploration of what a whale does, how it lives, what it thinks, whether it has religion, whether it thinks about death, and using these discussions and these explorations to really comment on human life. Melville, as an author, was regularly engaged with spirituality and religion and the basic questions of sort of, you know, what do we do with our lives and why are we here? And he used the hunting of the whale and the whale ship and the voyage out at sea to explore those ideas. So let's kind of move to the present. How do you think Moby Dick is relevant for readers today and, and why they should read it? Moby Dick is worth reading today, first and foremost, just really for the language and the characters. And I think if you haven't read Moby Dick before, allow it to be funny and enjoy it the first time and and enjoy the characters and the adventure and just the language 
I'm very interested in the natural history aspects and the biology and the depiction of the ocean. And I think there's a relevance there. Whether you care about ocean conservation today or not, it's important to understand where we've come from and how quickly, really, in terms of human time, our perceptions of the whale has changed and our perception of the ocean has changed. So I think that there's a real relevance to Moby Dick in that way, uh, both as a benchmark for our, our understanding of the ocean, as well as just simply a story that is so extraordinary with compelling characters and beautiful language and just these powerful bits to sort of comment on human behavior. And it's amazing, really, if you think about it, that this book about killing whales is popular still today, that it remains so much a part of our cultural fabric. You know, there's so much in it about capitalism, about race, about gender. The book just sort of keeps on giving like any good text. I read it for the first time on one of the islands off of Tahiti, Morea, where Melville, I would later learn, had spent several months. And I just sat there and I read it for, you know, four straight days and it just absolutely blew me away. It was just such an extraordinary, difficult, but powerful read. But to be able to read it at sea was just, it was just such a privilege and so extraordinary and powerful. And and I'd been spending all this time, you know, staying up late trying to understand Moby Dick. And I went all the way up aloft and I was all the way out on the Royal Yard, pretty much the farthest I could be from the deck. And way off in the distance, I saw a whale, like, and almost certainly a sperm whale by the spout. And I just, it was just so moving after spending all that time reading about it to see the whale and to watch the whale dive. And from then on, really, I've I've really thought about Moby Dick first as an ocean book. And I think that maybe is one message that for the podcast is that I think all the interpretations of Moby Dick are fantastic and personal and moving. For me, it's foremost a book about the ocean. There are very few books that are really set almost entirely at sea that engage with ocean animals in a metaphoric way. And I think it's important to see Moby Dick almost first as a book about the sea and how people thought about the sea in the 1800s. I've read Moby Dick a couple of times. Then after reading your book, Ahab's Rolling Sea, I'm really excited about reading it again. From reading your book, you helped me understand Moby Dick in ways that are, it's just wonderful. Your book makes Moby Dick so much more accessible. Thanks, that's, that's really nice. You know, I set out to write Ahab's Rolling Sea in part to provide where you could just go in and say, oh, what happened with that squid check? And you could just go to my book and say, all right, well, what, is, what? what actually was really happening in terms of what they knew about giant squid at that time. And so ideally, someone could just read my book cover to cover, even if they hadn't read Moby Dick, or they could just use it as a reference to dip into uh, if they're interested in a particular natural history scene in the novel. Um, but I, I don't know if it, if it always works that way, but that was certainly my goal. To research as Rolling Sea, I, I got to go on all these amazing expeditions, uh, meeting with whale researchers and shark researchers, and then I also spent a lot of time at sea, including going aloft um, every day as we sailed up to the Phoenix Islands from Fiji, and that there I spent time looking for whales. And over the years that I've spent time at sea, the appearance of something that is plastic floating at sea is quite profound and pretty impactful. And so I wrote a little bit about that towards the end of Ahab's Rolling Sea. And this is an excerpt of a student seeing something floating. The student is now, say, a week from land in the middle of the North Atlantic or the South Pacific or anywhere else on the global ocean. She is finally away from the eco guilt and everything else she's run away from ashore. She looks at the horizon, all of its 360 degrees of boundlessness. The sea to her seems immortal, timeless, the same to her as Noah's, everything she's been taught to imagine. 
After some peaceful time, she sees a speck off the bow. It floats half submerged on the surface. At first, she thinks it is the slippery back of a whale or the modern shell of a sea turtle. She wants to shout out to her shipmates. She berates herself for not bringing up her phone to take a photograph. As it approaches, or they are sailing towards it, she can't quite tell which. She then identifies that it is, in fact, but a sun-faded, falsely pink, coffin-like styrofoam cooler, half sunk. It is out of the reach of a boat hook. The captain denies her shouted request to launch a small boat to fit it out. Does this sight shatter everything she thought about the wild and pristine sea beyond the hand of Homo sapiens? I'm telling you that it does. It does. It does. It does. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Richard King and that you might pick up a copy of Moby Dick and experience the wonders of Melville's oceans. The music for this episode is Farewell to Tarwathi by Judy Collins. Jamie Horton is the voice of Ishmael. I hope you will share this episode of Nature Revisited with friends, family, and colleagues. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. I hope you will join me for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. <laughs>